What's going on fam? This is Raul from QB and Kennel and today we're going to be talking about fixing flaws. We're going to talk about fixing flaws. Today we're going to do this a little bit different. We're going to touch up on how to fix certain flaws. Before I start, let me just let you know. There's many ways to skin a cat. Not every single flaw can get fixed the very same way. You have to take into account pedigree, uh, the dogs that are behind in the, line in the lineage, and you know how prevalent that flaw is. If you have a dog that has been inbred, I'm gonna let you know right now, it's gonna be terribly hard to fix whatever flaw it is that we're trying to fix. Like always fam, uh, you gotta be looking at your dog's uh, blood and how strong the flaw and how prevalent it is within that bloodline. So say you go and you check out a dog's pedigree and all of a sudden you start seeing dogs um, where their feet are in grass, uh, when they're on slanted ground. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It should be flags, red flags that should be coming up in your head. Bells and whistles should be going off, letting you know that dog's got east-west, the dog's got high rear. Now, if you're a starting breeder, are you gonna go out there and right off the bat, get yourself uh, perfect dogs? More than likely not, fam. More than likely, uh, the breeder that's breeding and getting these perfect dogs, they're gonna be using them for show, they're gonna be using them for whatever it is that they're gonna be using them for, and more than likely, you're not gonna get access to it. But from a, you know, from a starting point uh, for a breeder, there are certain flaws that you wanna eliminate as much as you can. Again, everything that I'm talking about today is strictly subjective. All flaws um, cannot be fixed in the same way because they're uh, genetically different dog to dog. It's one of the reasons why I'm telling you to follow the pedigree. Some of the flaws that you want to stay away from uh, that are very easily identified is going to be an overbite or an underbite. Okay, a lot of people overlook that and then later on in their program run into trouble. The other one I like to stay away from from the very beginning is going to be east-west. I stay away from that as much as possible. I'll take a high rear from an outcross dog any day than an east-west just because east-west is not as easy to fix, but a high, high rear is a lot easier. One of the things uh, that people do before they buy pups is they look at mom and dad. And um, what exactly are you looking at? I mean, are you looking at the structure? Um, a lot of times what I like to do when I see mom and dad is I like to see how functional they are. I like to see them running around. I like to see them jumping. I like to see what their functionality is. Um, if you see a functional mom and dad, more than likely you're going to get a functional pup. Uh, either way, don't take any chances. Try to make sure you see mom and dad running around. And the pup, you want to throw the ball, a stick, whatever it is that captures their attention and see how they move. See what their movement is like. It should be harmonious. If you see, you know, legs going one way and legs going another, and the pup kind of jumping around while they're running around, you know, these should be little red flags that you should be looking at. Talk to dog breeders and even dog owners alike is pup's confidence. Pup's, co pup's confidence level is going to tell you a lot. Now, if you're just wanting a pet, you might not want the dog <laughs> with the most confidence. They usually turn out to be alphas or higher up in the hierarchy. And those dogs normally uh, are, you know, they take a little bit more of a challenge to train than, than say, a, a dog that isn't as confident and that pretty much listens to what you say on the spot and just wants to please you. So that's another good way of differ differentiating your, you know, your pups from the very get. On your pup, it's also very important, depending what it is that you want to use them for. Those of you that want pups uh, so that you can use them for some sort of uh, working task, uh, you want to pay co close attention to something like this or maybe even show up with a piece of rope or something. Either drag it on the floor or put it up high in the air and check out who's actually going after it. That's going to give you, uh, it's going to give you a good idea as to uh, the pups that you should be looking at. So fixing a flock, can it be that difficult? It definitely can if you're dealing with tight blood fam like I've said before. And it could be as simple as simply putting a correct male to a correct female on a simple flaw like a high rear. Uh, East-West sometimes a little bit more complicated than that. But even when you put a correct male to a flawed female or vice versa, uh, normally I find that you're going to get one or two correct pups off of that litter as long as the flawed dog is not inbred. If you have an inbred dog, uh, the flaw is going to be a lot more intense. And it's going to take you two, maybe three generations to fix. 
So what is an inbred dog? Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, inbred dog is any dog that's bred father to daughter, mother to son. I've also found half brother to half sister uh, to have a lot of inbreeding effects as well. So if you find these things in the pedigree, uh, you see one particular dog showing up in the immediate, uh, being the dog's immediate father and also being the dog's grandfather. Um, if you happen to see that his bloodline is flawed, now you're dealing with something that's pretty prevalent. You might want to stay away from that kind of stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong if you still like that one dog that's appearing two and three times in the pedigree. So there's nothing wrong to get a pup off of him, just not off of that particular breeding because you may be dealing with prevalent faults. You might want to find it whenever they cross that one particular dog to a female that's outside of that bloodline. That's considered an outcross. At that point, you might want to jump on that. Uh, you might be able to get something that, even though the dog may be flawed, um, you're not going to get it as prevalent. You're going to be able to fix it. And maybe even you might just get an unflawed dog to begin with. So these are the things that you want to be looking at, fam. Now, are all dogs that are inbred um, flawed? Uh, I want to say no. Um, but the pups that they produce, whatever type of flaw that shows up there is going to be prevalent. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And I'm going to tell you this real quick. Stay away from stiff stifles. For those of you that don't know, if you look at the stifle of the dog, which is on the back leg, it should have angulation. You can go to the ABKC or UKC standard by looking it up on Google, and you'll see the pictures that they have so you could have an idea what is a flawed stifle and what isn't a flawed stifle. When you have a stiff stifle, it's pretty much uh, a straight stifle for the most part. And even though the dog may not have a high rear, you don't want that stifle to be stiff because it's gonna compromise a lot of the movement that the dog may have. The flaw you really wanna stay away from is a small head, a small cranium. That turns out to be a very dominant trait. Uh, that particular trait, if you bring it into your yard, is gonna be real hard for you to get away from. If you wanna realize what a dominant or regressive, uh, recessive trait are, uh, what I normally do is I just go back to the wolf. Whatever's prevailing on them is usually gonna be prevalent overall. Um, for example, I've seen gray wolves for the most part are east-west, if not all. Um, you're also going to notice that their head, their cranium isn't necessarily too big or wide. They also have an elongated muzzle. Uh, these traits are actually uh, dominant traits, so make sure you stay away from those. One of the things you want to look at uh, when you're looking at a dog that's east-west is look at his shoulders, look at his chest, and then look at the position of his feet on the ground. If you have a dog that's A-framed, okay? Uh, it could be for one of two things usually. It could be restricted shoulders where the dog has a wide chest, but the shoulders are, not, uh, are too narrow. They're not wide enough to compensate. And also the, the inverse where you might have a dog that has enough uh, shoulders, but his chest is really, really weak. And that's going to cause an A-frame type of, uh, of uh, structure and therefore the dog is usually gonna compensate down on its feet. This is why I normally like to stick to the H-frame types, types of dogs where you see their chest come across and create a letter H along with the shoulders up top. Okay, so the shoulders are not coming in, they're actually wide in conjunction with the chest and therefore it creates that perfect H structure. When you get that, usually, for the most part, you're, gonna get, um, you're not gonna get compensation down on the feet. Now, with that being said, can you have an H-frame that has east-west down, uh, down on the feet because its pasterns are weak? Absolutely. So keep your eyes on the pasterns, fam. Make sure that the pasterns are not too long, okay, and that when the dog stands, that wrist or that pastern is actually not coming up in an angle. It's actually coming up like this, almost straight up, okay? Uh, these are the things that you want to be looking at. To prey drive. Back to prey drive, fam. Check them out, everybody else doing their thing. This little puppy, it's over here doing its thing. Things to, things to consider when you're about to get a pup. Things to consider when you're trying to keep a pup that's got the correct temperament. Tip it you wanna keep an eye on. Does the dog snore while it's awake or make snorting noises? The dog's tongue out even when its mouth is closed. 
Is the pup too timid or is it active with the other pups? I usually stay away from timid pups. I like my pups to be around the rest of them, messing around one way or another. If there's a pup sitting all the way out here in the corner by himself and he wants nothing to do with all the other pups, especially if it's out of an inbreeding, I'm not even trying to fix that. I just completely stay away from it. Um, it's a lot easier to manage these pups and their temperament, uh, whether whether they may seem hyper to you or not. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to work and fix this than it would be if there was a pup all the way over there in the corner. Fam, whether I'm looking for a working dog or I'm looking for a dog to just be a companion, I need to make sure that my dogs socialize well and adapt to people and other dogs. Once I'm able to stabilize that, these are the dogs that we breed. That's how you maintain good temperament within your yard. The fastest way to fix a flaw is to simply prevent them from the get. I'm a true believer that one of the best ways to fix your flaws is by simply preventing them. So I'm letting you know right now, if you stay away from size and you err on the side of confirmation, you're going to do just fine with time. When you want that size, a size is the easiest thing to get. Lastly, I'm going to leave you with this, fam. Confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. Size is the easiest thing to get. Leave it as one of the last things that you're going to bring into your program. Make sure that you conform your dogs first, and then you bring in the size. If you do it the other way around, you're going to have a harder time. Hey, fam, I'm going to hold you up too long today. This has been Ralph for QBNK. Peace out.